HMS Audacious was one of four King George V super dreadnoughts built for the Royal Navy in 1911. She displaced around 23,000 tons and was armed with 10 13 and a half inch guns, making her one of the most powerful dreadnoughts within the Grand Fleet at the start of World War I, making her loss even more devastating. Audacious was to fall victim to mines placed by the German merchant cruiser Berlin, who had laid a large number of mines off Torrey Island northwest of Loch Swilly, then serving as a Grand Fleet anchorage. At 9 a.m. on the 28th of October 1914, Audacious struck one of those mines and began taking on water. Through the confusion of the situation, Audacious was lost later that afternoon, being one of only two British dreadnoughts lost during the war, the other being HMS Vanguard and Scapa Flow, most likely due to an internal explosion, making Audacious the only Royal Navy dreadnought lost to enemy action during the Great War. To briefly cover the development of the King George V class battleships of the 1910 estimates, they were a modified version of the preceding Orion class dreadnoughts, or as they became known, super dreadnoughts, due to their increase in size, machinery, armor, and armament. The changes as compared to the Orion class were increases in displacement, an increase in speed, and changes to the design of the internal protection to hopefully make it more complete. The class had four ships in it, the lead ship, King George V, Centurion, Ajax, and Audacious. Audacious entered service in 1913, just in time for her and her sisters to become one of the most powerful battle squadrons in the Royal Navy and the world. The early career of Audacious wasn't particularly notable besides participating in a test mobilization in early July of 1914 of the Royal Navy as an economizing measure rather than the annual summer maneuvers. Following this in the July crisis, the Grand Fleet made their way to Scapa Flow to be further away from German ports and to avoid the threat of German torpedo attacks. The threat of German U-boats was real even early in the war, especially for Audacious and her sisters in the Second Battle Squadron, as on August 8th, south of Fair Island between the Orkneys and Shetlands, Ajax, Audacious, and another dreadnought were conducting gunnery practice when a torpedo came dangerously close to Audacious, where the following day the cruiser Birmingham rammed and sank the U-boat U-15. Not only that, but in the early months of the war, the Royal Navy had a squadron of antiquated armored cruisers patrolling a part of the North Sea known as the Broad 14s. Due to the adverse weather conditions of the North Sea, they were left without an escort on September 22nd, and three ships of the group were sunk by one U-boat, U-9. Only a short time later, an even older cruiser, Hawk, was sunk by a U-boat in the North Sea. This is to have large implications in the sinking of Audacious, which Robert K. Massey has this to say in Castles of Steel, Britain, Germany, in the winning of the Great War at Sea. The sinking of the three ships stimulated immediate changes. The two surviving sisters, Euryllus and Bacanti, were banished from the North Sea and sent to duty at Gibraltar, beyond the range of U-boats. Zigzagging at 13 knots was mandatory for all large warships in submarine waters. The Admiralty sent a grim command to the Navy. If one ship is torpedoed or strikes a mine, the disabled ship must be left to her fate, and other large ships clear out of the dangerous area, calling up minor vessels to render assistance. Never again, either in Parliament or the press, or at one of his London clubs, did Admiral Lord Charles Beresford describe the submarines as playthings or toys. Compounding this was a report that turned out to be false of a U-boat inside the Grand Fleet base at Scapa Flow. The recently appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Grand Fleet, Admiral John Jellicoe, who had apprehension about the new base for the Grand Fleet, wanted to move the Grand Fleet further west to minimize the threat of submarines as it seemed they were more than playthings. Now, if you know anything about the Royal Navy in the First and Second World War, you'd know that their home base of Scapa Flow is one of the most secure places for a fleet due to its geography and defenses, barring a few exceptions. However, this was not the case in the first two months of the war. At the start of the war, Scapa Flow was a desolate island outpost guarded by local territorial army members with four small mobile guns, whose civilian occupation often made them unavailable. The great majority of the men are unable to attend camp owing to the fact that the training season coincides with the season of heron fishing upon which their livelihood depends, as a report from the war office describes. Even at the outbreak of the war, Scapa Flow was not ready to host so many vessels as the small base did not have the proper facilities to house so many men and supply them and their ships. It also didn't help that Scapa Flow was not connected to the mainland by rail, meaning supplies had to be brought by ship. 
This meant that Admiral John Jellicoe had his ships at sea training, as he saw it as a better defense than sitting in what was essentially an unprotected harbor. Because of the recent threats, Jellicoe got the approval of the Admiralty to transfer two battle squadrons to two new harbors, Loch Nakiel on the Isle of Mull on the Scottish west coast, and Loch Swilly on the north of Ireland. Both harbors had narrow and easily defensible entrances, as well as a shallow bottom making entrances for submarines difficult. However, the real threat to Audacious and the other ships of the second battle squadron was that of mines, not torpedoes. Now, to quote Massey again, because a mine cannot distinguish the nationality of a ship that runs into it, the Hague Convention of 1907 had agreed to keep the open seas free of these lethal weapons floating beneath the ocean's surface. Belligerents were permitted to lay offensive minefields only in hostile territorial waters within three miles of an enemy's coast. Nevertheless, because the North Sea is generally shallow and therefore particularly suitable for moored contact mines, the German Navy, preparing for war, began accumulating a large stock to use them aggressively. Beginning on the war's first day, when the converted steamer König Louise laid her mines off the Suffolk coast, German ships and submarines placed over 25,000 mines in the North Sea most of them in defiance of the Hague Convention. Commodore Tirrett was appalled by this indiscriminate and distinctly barbarian mining. Expecting a short war, he noted, it'll be months before the North Sea is safe for yachting. Now, the Grand Fleet and Royal Navy were not exactly prepared to deal with the German mines. By the time Jellicoe took command of the Grand Fleet, it was only assigned six elderly destroyers converted into minesweepers to deal with the German threat. In October, the fast 17,000 North German Lloyd Liner Berlin, which had been armed as a merchant cruiser and was also equipped with a large number of mines, passed through the North Sea into the Atlantic with orders to mine the approaches to Glasgow on the River Clyde. Instead, the captain of the Berlin chose to mine the area off Tory Island, northwest of Loch Swilly, choosing it because it was the main trade route from Liverpool to America. On the night of the 22nd of October, Berlin laid 200 mines across the entrance to the channel used by most of the shipping in and out of Liverpool. Following this, she sailed north to attack shipping to Archangel, but was forced to seek shelter in Norway, and thus interred by the Norwegian government. Still, on the 26th, Berlin's minefield claimed its first victim, and the merchantman Manchester Commerce struck a mine and sank. For several days, this loss did not reach the Admiralty or Jellicoe aboard Iron Duke in Loch Swilly. On October 27th, Jellicoe ordered Vice Admiral Sir George Warrender, the commander of the 2nd Battle Squadron, to take it out for gunnery practice. These were some of the newest and most powerful dreadnoughts in the Grand Fleet, and they were going to carry out firing practice near Torrey Island off the coast of Donegal. With the battle fleet consisting of the firing line, Centurion, the flagship, Ajax, and Audacious, while the target line consisted of Orion, Monarch, and Thunderer. On the morning of the 28th, the 2nd Battle Squadron with Audacious 3rd in line maneuvered, and as she was turning onto the gunnery range with the official time for the signal given to make this turn at 8.40am, and approximately at 8.45, a dull explosion could be felt in the ship. An officer on the bridge believed that she had accidentally fired one of her 13.5-inch guns, but with no sign of smoke, he then thought it was another ship. There were thoughts that Audacious had been hit by a torpedo, and with the history of the ship almost being torpedoed in August, along with recent sinkings of the elderly cruisers in September, it was a logical conclusion. At 9am, the order had been given to close all doors and hatches. The ship's company was at action stations. At about this time, the ship took on a slight list to port, and it was then realized that the ship might be mortally stricken. All bulkheads and doors in the vicinity of the explosion were checked to see whether they needed shoring up, and to determine whether the starboard wing compartments could be flooded to compensate the weight of water in the port side, and get the ship back to an even keel. Around the time of the explosion, reports from the engine room explain, There had been a small splash of water in the area some 16 feet above the main deck level. Furthermore, eyewitnesses stated that the condenser in the port wing engine room lifted slightly, then dropped again when the explosion occurred. As a direct result of the explosion, the following compartments were flooded. Port wing engine room, Port aft hydraulic engine room, dynamo room. The following areas filled with seepage. X shell room, watertight compartments near the port wing engine room, bunkers on the starboard side, central engine room, junior officer's bathroom, X turret cooler spaces, after medical distribution spaces, bathroom flat, main deck abaft X 13.5 inch turret, middle deck in the area. With the plausible threat of a submarine in the area, following Admiralty orders issued after the sinking of the aforementioned Picanti armored cruisers, 
Vice Admiral Warrender took the rest of the 2nd Battle Squadron away to avoid any further attacks if there was a submarine in the area. There was one confirmed thing, though. Audacious was taking on water, and lots of it. Audacious was brought out of line away from Ajax and Centurion, and was put into the wind to keep her steady. She was healing over approximately 10 to 15 degrees, and did not appear to be riding herself. Because of this, Captain Cecil Dampier of Audacious believed that she was sinking fast, and that she needed to be abandoned. But as the light cruiser Liverpool escorting the large ships was circling the sinking Audacious, she began to settle more slowly. Finding that she could still make nine knots, Dampier decided that he was going to try to make it to Loch Swilly to try to beach her there. While trying to right the ship, the crew struggled to close many of the valves, and water could not be prevented from entering the central engine room. By 10 a.m., the water was five feet deep, but there was no evidence of the longitudinal bulkheads having cracked. Upon inspection, it was found that the explosion had taken place approximately five to ten feet forward of the after engine room bulkhead. The port engine rooms were out of action, so it was up to the starboard engine rooms as water continually crept into those compartments. And a little before 11 a.m., the starboard compartments had to be abandoned, leaving Audacious dead in the water. While this was going on, Jellico, who had previously been notified, was gathering every destroyer, tug, and trawler at Loch Swilly and Loch Nakiel to help Audacious and to prevent the presumed U-boat from making further attacks. But until there was evidence that there was no U-boat in the area, Jellicoe would not send another battleship to attempt a tow of the floundering Dreadnought, the pre-Dreadnought Exmouth being put on short notice to go perform the tug. Vice Admiral Sir Lewis Bailey, who was in command of the other battle squadron in Loch Swilly, offered to go to Audacious by destroyer to take control of the situation, which Jellicoe agreed to. Back on Audacious by 11, all steam power had been lost, which made it difficult to ready the boats as the crew had been doing. All non-essential crew were taken off the ship, but because Captain Dampier believed that the ship could still be saved, he and a work party of 250 men stayed aboard the ship. The light cruiser Liverpool and several destroyers in the area who received the distress call of Audacious, it was decided to take her in tow. At 1.30, the 45,000-ton White Star liner Olympic arrived on the scene, with her captain H.J. Haddock volunteering to help by taking her in tow, being ignorant of the threat of submarines or the underwater mines. With the destroyers taking the hawsers from Audacious to the liner, Olympic made little headway with the battleship in tow. The heavy seas and the weight of the sinking dreadnought, it was clear that it was an impossible task, the hawsers repeatedly snapping. Liverpool tried as well, but it would go equally as poor. A final attempt by the collier Thornhill had just as much success. Jellicoe that afternoon received the report of the sinking of Manchester Commerce by a mine, and another merchant vessel had struck a mine the previous night. At 5 p.m., Jellicoe was certain that Audacious had not been torpedoed and instead had been struck by a mine. He then ordered Exmouth to try to tow the sinking dreadnought. On the scene at 5, it was getting dark. The quarter deck was completely awash, and a lot of water was getting below deck, so much so she was becoming unsteady. Shortly after 5 p.m., all hands except 50 men were ordered off. Both Admiral Bailey and Captain Dampier would stay on. By 6.15, the ship was in a bad state and it was decided to abandon her. Bailey and Dampier were taken off to Liverpool, along with the rest of the men. So by the time Exmouth arrived on the scene, it was too late. Liverpool was ordered to stand by through the night, which made sense as by 6.50, the angle of the list was 30 degrees, but she still showed no signs of turning over. Two hours passed before stability vanished, with Massey describing her end as, but at 9 p.m. after a 12-hour struggle, Audacious suddenly capsized a few seconds later blew up. Ironically, this explosion in the empty vessel was responsible for the only casualty in the sinking of the battleship. A piece of debris flying 800 yards landed on the deck of Liverpool, where it killed a watching petty officer. From British Battleships of World War I by R.A. Burt, Audacious lay upside down until approximately 9 p.m., when there was a terrific explosion and flames and debris shot to a height of at least 300 feet. Two lesser explosions in the air were reported, and these were thought to have been foreign shells exploding. It would seem that either A or B magazine had exploded, the theory being that the high explosive shells had been displaced by the ship's list and had detonated on hitting the floor. This would have ignited the cordite and produced the spectacular explosion in a large sheet of flame. It was recorded that the magazines contained 1,120 13.5-inch shells and 2,400 4-inch shells, with their charges. 
Eyewitnesses claim that the ship's bows were at an angle of at least 45 degrees during the explosion. Almost immediately afterwards, Audacious disappeared beneath the waves. Jellico, fearing that his advantage in dreadnoughts was so slim that if word got out to the Germans, they would come out at an inopportune time. The ship's crew was quietly reassigned to other ships, with Audacious still being on all the list of ships and fleet maneuvers. Jellico, dismayed by this loss of a dreadnought, was desperately anxious that the sinking be kept a secret. That night, when Olympic reached Loch Swilly, the Admiral prohibited any communication between ship and shore. Then he signaled the Admiralty, urging that the news be suppressed. The Grand Fleet's margin in numbers over the High Seas Fleet was so slight, Jellico reckoned that he now had 17 serviceable dreadnoughts to Ingenol's 15. That knowledge of the loss might bring the Germans out at the wrong time. Jellico realized that owing to the presence of Olympic, the loss probably could not be concealed for long, but any time he could gain would help. Churchill and his colleagues agreed, but because concealment of naval losses was so contrary to British and Royal Navy tradition, the Admiralty could not issue the order on its own. The decision went up to the Cabinet, where they approved it, fearing that it might encourage the Ottoman Empire to join the war on the side of the Germans, which ultimately they would regardless of the sinking of Audacious. The sinking was finally announced on the 13th of November 1918, two days after the armistice. On November 14, 1914, the Philadelphia Public Ledger published a photograph of Audacious sinking, but the sinking was still officially kept a secret until after the war, as I mentioned. Four days after the sinking of Audacious, Jellico traveled to London to confer with Churchill and the newly appointed First Sea Lord, Jackie Fisher. To Jellico, it seemed even more evident that no matter where ships were, they were threatened by German attacks. This point was already illustrated in a letter on September 30th, where he had written Churchill, It is suicidal to forego our advantageous position in the big ships by risking them in waters infested with submarines. The result might quite easily be such a weakening of our battle fleet and battle cruiser strength as seriously to jeopardize the future of the country by giving over to the Germans the command of the open sea. Jellico suggested that the Grand Fleet should operate north of the Orkneys, with a line of cruisers spread 120 miles to the south of the Grand Fleet to continue the blockade of Germany. This event had effects on the Admiralty and the Commander-in-Chief of the Grand Fleet, making him even more cautious with his intended battle tactics. Taking a letter from Jellico to the Admiralty found in Castles of Steel, he writes, If, for instance, the enemy battle fleet were to turn away from our advancing fleet, I should assume the intention was to lead us over mines and submarines, and decline to be so drawn. I desire particularly to draw the attention of their lordships to this point, since it may be deemed a refusal of battle and might possibly result in failure to bring the enemy to action as soon as it is expected. Such a result would absolutely be repugnant to the feelings of all British naval officers and men, but with new, untried methods of warfare, new tactics must be devised. These, if not understood, may bring odium upon me, but so long as I have the confidence of their lordships, I intend to pursue the proper course to defeat and annihilate the enemy's battle fleet, without regard to uninstructed opinion or criticism. The situation is a difficult one. It is quite possible that half our battle fleet might be disabled by underwater attack before the guns open fire at all. The safeguard against the submarines will consist in moving the battle fleet at very high speed to flank before the gun action commences. This will take us off the ground of which the enemy desires to fight. But if the battle fleet remains in sight of one another, the limited submerged radius of action and speed of the submarines will prevent them from following, and I feel that after an interval of high-speed maneuvering, I could safely close. The caution that Jellico illustrated is understandable, but to put such a proposal in October 1914 before the Admiralty that was about to court-martial Admiral Trowbridge for not meeting SMS Gibbon in battle in the Mediterranean required someone confident in their ability and a sense of purpose that few have. The Admiralty approved the Commander-in-Chief's letter, giving him their full confidence for the conduct of the fleet and fleet action. However, they did not approve his previous request to move the Grand Fleet so far north as they felt it needed to have recurring sweeps in the North Sea. Out of the 41 dreadnought battleships that fought in the Great War for the Royal Navy, Audacious was the only one lost to enemy action. I will close out with one last quote from R.A. Burt. The cause was never officially confirmed, but it was thought that she had struck a floating mine displaced by Centurion or Ajax, which were steaming ahead of her. The possibility that she had been torpedoed was never ruled out. The inquiry into the loss of a particularly new battleship 
found that the strength of the longitudinal bulkheads was inadequate to stop water from reaching the central part of the ship, the major factor contributing to her loss. Bulkheads buckled, doors could not be closed, and valves stuck, all of which made it extremely difficult to prevent the ship from filling rapidly. Thank you all for watching, and until next time my friends, have a great week.